Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10 primitivist masterpieces for you beginners out there. Now, what was primitivism? Oh, it's so much fun. You're going to love this stuff. Prim primitivism was not in music such a well-defined movement. I wouldn't call it a movement. It was more a selection of pieces by various composers, but it meant it meant an emphasis around the turn of the 20th century, starting about then, on music that had this, well, you might say primal quality, but how do you do that in music? You do it with rhythm. You do it with lots of percussion. You do it sometimes with the imaginative use of very simple folk elements of melody, sometimes just the opposite with crazy expressionist dissonant, you know, pileups of harsh harmonies, sometimes combinations of both. But the idea is that it should give you a real gut punch in terms of, in terms of its impact and its power. And one of the ironies, the great irony about musical primitivism is that in order to achieve these primal results, composers often resulted to the most sophisticated orchestral and instrumental apparatus and avant-garde playing techniques that have ever been conceived. Huge orchestras, massive concatenations of percussion instruments, enormous resources of color and virtuoso playing techniques for the instruments and sounds that people never heard of. I mean, none of this would have happened had it not been for the rise of virtuoso conductors, virtuoso symphony orchestras, and it was really uh, an aspect not of sort of primal originalness, but almost of decadence of, of this, this idea that you were going to achieve some kind of, some kind of, you know, altered state of consciousness and, and, and simplicity. I mean, there is a sense, you know, primitive means kind of simple, right? Using enormously complex resources. So that it's kind of an, an oxymoron, you know? I mean, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing, primitivism. It really is. And when you listen to these pieces, you should keep in mind, in some respects, you know, the, the, the basic simplicity, one, two, gut punch results um, achieved by just extraordinary orchestral resources being pushed to their very limits. That's what makes this stuff so much fun. So let's get to it. The ultimate primitive masterpiece, primitivist masterpiece was Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. This was the piece that caused a revolution in the history of music in 1913 at its premiere. It it caused a riot at that performance. It was the piece that some people say liberated rhythm. It's all about complex, very complex rhythms. <clears throat> I mean, for all that it's supposed to be primitive, these are very, very tricky rhythms. It's still a very difficult piece to play. It's hard to count. I mean, Stravinsky rewrote it a couple of times so that players could actually get the rhythms correct. And it's written for an absolutely enormous orchestra. It was the dinosaur music in, in Walt Disney's Fantasia. So, you know, you probably have heard some of it before. It is based on folk music. And you hear these very simple folk tunes, but also piled up in harmony that's sometimes unbelievably dissonant and, and, and harsh and abrasive, and oh my God, it's exciting. And it's a ballet. I mean, the piece is a ballet. It, it, it can be danced, theoretically, but it is known universally today as a concert piece. You'll almost never see it staged as a ballet because, I mean, the whole objection to the original performance was not so much the music as it was the choreography. I mean, you won't want to see a bunch of sort of, you know, primal hominids you know, dressed in burlap, jumping up and down, going, rah, 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 you know, that kind of thing. It was, it was not what most people considered to be ballet. Um, I'd love to see a choreography that actually makes sense, but, you know, at the end, it's about the, the sacrificial dance of a virgin to the gods of spring, and so she has to dance herself to death at the big climax. And again, you know, the orchestra's going insane and everything's going nuts, and it's all whooping and freaking out. And then, of course, you know, this, you have this little ballerina who's supposedly, 
you know, dancing yourself to death. It's kind of hard to do that justice as a single dance. So it's much better to keep it your imagination. And that is the place where all primitivist excursions in music begin. With Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. Next, Irvin Schulhoff, Ogalala. <clears throat> Now, Ogallala is an Indian name. It's the name of, or Native American name, if you want to call it that. It's the, the name of an aquifer that underlies a good bit of the Midwest, including Nebraska. There's an Ogallala County in Nebraska where I got a speeding ticket on my way home from uh, university as I was whizzing cross country. So I know Ogallala very well. But this particular primitivist ballet is, like many of these primitivist works, the, the idea of what is primitive for European composers at the beginning of the 20th century was, was the New World, and particularly the Indian cultures of the New World, whether they were North American or South American. Mostly they were South American. They were Mayan or Inca or something like that. And this is what Ogallala is. And it's a piece for chamber orchestra with just a busload of percussion instruments based on one very simple four-note motive dun, 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 <clears throat> that gets repeated like 30 trillion billion zillion times. It's extremely exciting, lots of fun. Schulhoff was one of those composers who died in a, a Nazi internment camp. He was a Jewish composer, a Czech musician who, like many, had his music banned and he was incredibly talented and wrote some fabulous, fabulous music, of which Ogallala is a prime example. He had a Dadaist period where he just wrote all this crazy stuff. And it's enormous fun, and it makes the Stravinsky sound very, very upper crust and high end in terms of its primitivist credentials. You know, there's a limit to how much you can reduce music to nothingness and still have it make any sense. And Ogallala is kind of getting there. Its musical materials are stripped down to the bare minimum, but presented with a maximum of rhythmic ingenuity, color, and general fury. So it's wonderful fun. Next, George Antile, the ballet mechanique. Now, one aspect of primitivism that really highlights the oxymoronic nature of the entire enterprise is that there is also machine music, music that celebrates, celebrates technology and factory kind of things. And that is also very primitive because it's not human. It's mechanical. It's based simply on the rhythms of a mechanism. And Antile's ballet mechanique caused a scandal. And this was in Paris, of course, after the Rite of Spring. He was considered at the time the bad boy of music. After which Antile moved back to his native United States and, and became an, a, a newspaper columnist. He answered, I think, letters to the Lovelorn or something. He did one of those sort of lifestyle columns. And he was an inventor. Um, really a fascinating, fascinating character. He worked with Hedy Lamarr in developing um, anti-missile technology during World War II, and his style became rather populist and much tamer than it was during the, his heyday in Paris. But the ballet, ballet mechanique was written at the time for all kinds of, you know, devices like, you know, aircraft propellers, and, you know, this gadgets and gizmos. The, the version that we has come down to us um, is meant to be played by a rather more sensible ensemble. And it is very mechanical and quite a bit of fun to listen to. It's not that long. It's not going to make you crazy. You play it once and you go, ah, there we go. Now I know the ballet mechanique. You don't need to know that much more about it. And I wouldn't say you'll be playing it every day but it was, it was a moment. And it was a moment inspired, as so many of these pieces were, by Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. Once the doors were open, the floodgates opened, all of these young composers said, ah, I can do that. I can do that better <clears throat> or more. And so they tried, and this was the result. So after Antile, the Mexican composer Silvestre Revueltas, La Noche de los Mayas. Yeah, the Night of the Mayas. Now, this is a big suite in four or so movements taken from a film score that he wrote. Um, and it was heavily edited and added to because Revueltas, he died quite young 
and and left his music in a, in a, in a messy state. And so there are very few completed compositions. Um, this is an exciting piece of music, an absolutely brilliant piece of music, full of extraordinary color. And I, I played um, the the last bit of it, which was you know, just an extraordinary piece. It really is. It's so much fun to do. So that's something that you should keep in mind. And that's an actual Mayan primitivist work by an actual Latin American composer. Because most of these, <clears throat> excuse me, something in my throat. Most of these are by composers who were obviously not of the region. And so it's kind of fun to hear some, some authentic stuff by somebody who was much closer to the source. Uh, beautiful, beautiful work. Mosolov Iron Foundry. Now, the Iron Foundry is like a three and a half minute or four minute piece by a Russian futurist composer written at the turn of the centuries. And it is, century, and it is what it says it is. It's a factory. It's up there with the ballet mechanique, although it's much, much shorter. And it, it's based on a tiny little tune that it just goes, pum, crunch, crunch, psh, tum, crunch, crunch, like that. So if you like psh, dum, crunch, crunch, you're going to love the Iron Foundry. It's a delightful little piece and, and full, of, full of color, and it really ought to be performed more often. It's kind of depressing that it doesn't get played because it's a great like concert opener or overture to something. Um, you know, afterwards, Mosolov became a, a hardcore socialist realist, and his music became vastly less interesting. But at this point, there was really something going on. And you can hear it in this tiny little piece. He is really the definition of a one-shot wonder composer because this is the only piece of his that's at all well known. More has been recorded since, but Iron Foundry is his, his calling card musically. Oh, yeah, back to Latin America. Ginastera, the Argentinian composer. Alberto Ginastera. Now, he wrote some sort of primitivist ballets, Estancia, Panambi, and, and things like that, they were called. Um, they're really quite marvelous in the beginning of his career, but also at the very, very end of his career, he wrote a piece called Popol Vuh, which is the Mayan creation myth set to music. And it's a tone poem. It's a tone poem in seven or eight movements. He died before it was complete. Um, there's one movement that's missing. No one's quite sure which movement it is. And because the piece was thought to be incomplete, it was ignored after he died until, until the 1980s when Leonard Slatkin got his hands on it and actually premiered it. And since then, it has been recorded a couple of times. And Hinesterra evolved a style which was sort of like folkloric expressionism. It was atonal or 12 tone for the most part, but incredibly rhythmic, extremely exciting. You can hear another very famous example in the finale of his, his piano concerto number one. It ends with a brilliant toccata that Emerson, Lake and Palmer made a setting of. It's marvelous. And Popol Vuh is really the apotheosis of his entire late style. It has the rhythm, it has the intensity, it has the, the crazy dissonant harmonies. It's a wonderful work, absolutely wonderful. So if you're interested in that kind of, that kind of, you know, primevelocity, the very, very sophisticated expressionist primitivism, then go for Hinastera's Popol Vuh. You are not going to be sorry. There's an excellent recording on Naxos, and Slatkin recorded it for RCA. God knows where that recording is. And now we come to another major, major, major piece of primitivist classic stuff, Bartok's The Miraculous Mandarin. And this is modernist primitivism. Yes, because it takes place in a city. It's a story about, about a, a woman who is forced to, to, to uh, well, she's a prostitute, and she's kidnapped by a bunch of thugs who force her to lure men into their den so that they can beat them up and rob them. And it begins with this wonderful portrait of a traffic jam in the city. I mean, sort of, you know, the, the modern equivalent of a primitivist tableau. I mean, that's what it is. Um, the music is is based, like most of Bartok's music, on Hungarian folk melodies, but they're very, 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 um, very, all they're treated in a, in a very sophisticated way with an extraordinary orchestral apparatus 
and it has a big chase fugue in the middle of it. What happens finally is that the last client of the woman is a, a Mandarin, a Chinese guy, um, who they proceed to beat up and kill, but he won't die. He refuses to die, so it becomes very spooky. And he keeps coming back to life and pursuing her, and it's only when she allows him to finally embrace her and she gives himself herself to him that his wounds open and he finally bleeds to death. Isn't that fun? Yeah, music is it's, it's amazing. Now, a lot of these pieces exist as suites, um, while the Rite of Spring doesn't, but, but the Miraculous Mandarin does. Oh, pardon me, some of these, if they're ballets, and the Miraculous Mandarin was a ballet, it exists as a suite. And you can get it either way. You can get the complete ballet, or you can get the suite, either way. But like all primitive masterpieces, this, this work is based on very, very simple elements. Extremely simple elements. The motive of the Mandarin is just, yada, yada. That's it. Two notes. I mean, it permeates the fabric of the work. But Bartok builds this unbelievably colorful and incredibly complex edifice from these very, very, very simple elements. It's an extraordinary work. So after that, well, I've got three pieces that I think really just <clears throat> capture it all. One is a fairly recent, well, I mean, past few decades, late 20th century work by the American composer, the late American composer, Christopher Rouse. And Rouse wrote a piece called Gorgon. It's based on the Gorgons, the Greek Gorgons, the most famous of whom was Medusa. It ends with Medusa. Wow, what a piece this is. It has three movements, one for each of the three Gorgons, with little interludes in between them. And this is is the, I mean, Rouse was a composer who was heavily influenced by the sonority and rhythms of American rock music, um, heavy metal even, and you hear it in this piece. It is unbelievable. Just listen to Medusa. Give yourself, give yourself a treat. It's only about four minutes long. It is hair-raising. So far, Gorgon has only been recorded once by Marin Alsop with the Colorado Symphony on RCA. It was later licensed to and re-released on Phoenix. You can find it as a download. I don't know if you'll find the actual LP, although I, I see it on Amazon periodically. It exists. And wow, what a, what a powerful and insane piece of music this is. For those of you who like primitivist works, you know, if you're into like, you know, the Rite of Spring and Ogallala and Antile and all that stuff, you got to hear Rouse's Gorgon. It's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Then after Gorgon, Edgard Varese, Amérique. Now Varese was an avant-garde composer at the beginning of the 20th century. He only wrote maybe uh, 10 pieces of music in his entire career. He destroyed everything. No two pieces are exactly alike. He was one of those guys who had to remain at the forefront of everything, so he, he, he wrote sort of an entirely new conception of what he was doing with each successive work. His most famous piece is Ionization, which is a six-minute work solely for percussion instruments with no actual pitches at all. That is a primitivist, ma primitivist masterpiece, but I think the one that, you know, gets the most attention, is the most fun, is the enormous tone poem, Amérique, which is another Mayan, Inca, South American kind of effusion, and it's an extraordinary piece, clear, clearly based on some of the sonorities and and conceptual workings of Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. It's written for an even bigger orchestra, if that's possible. It had, it, Verez's great invention was to use sirens in the orchestra for what he called sound curves. Like that, along with lots of other stuff. And you've got like a lion's roar, it goes rawr, and all kinds of crazy percussion. Oh gosh, it's fun. And it has, I think, possibly the loudest final chord in all of music. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how the thing ends. It's just going crash, bang, crash, with the percussion. And then this huge thing with sirens going off. And God, it's fun. It's so much fun. It's about 20 minutes long. 
and absolutely amazing. And you know what fascinates me about these things is people say, oh God, that music isn't for beginners. It's so complex, it's so twisted. No, 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 this is absolutely for beginners. Because if you listen to film scores, if you listen to heavy metal, if you listen to all of that sort of, you know, loud contemporary stuff, I mean, this is part of that culture. It's part of the larger trend. You know, classical music, it, it didn't exist in a vacuum. It existed in a society, in a civilization, which was doing certain things and following certain trends. And some of those trends manifested themselves in popular music, and some of them manifested themselves in art music or less popular music. But it's all of a piece. It's all of one piece. And so, yeah, to say that, you know, beginners can only listen to this because, you know, that's too hard is... I just think such a ridiculous proposition. It really is. And I, I think you'll agree with me. However, however, we have the concluding, concluding work. And that is Jan Leifs. Jan Leifs, who is a, a, or John Leifs, if you want to call him that, the Icelandic national composer. He wrote a bunch of pieces based on natural disasters of various kinds. And one of them is called Hekla. It is a volcanic eruption, and nothing is more primitive or primal than a volcanic eruption. This I have performed. Um, there is a disc called Earquake, which I've reviewed and made a video about, where I was special guest anvil soloist with the Helsinki Philharmonic. It's on the Ondine label. It's an entire disc of head-banging classical music containing several primitivist masterpieces, of which Hecla is the climax. It's only been recorded three times. Um, I must say that one on Ondine is the best one. Sorry, I have to I have to be honest about it. It really is not because I'm playing the anvils. It has 20 percussionists. You have to play actual volcanic rocks with hammers and it has cannons going off and there's a choir at the very end and it's it's just insane, especially once the volcano really gets going. It begins with you know, mysterious silence, and then the eruption starts. And then from then on, it just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. It's got chains rattling and tam-tams crashing and double timpani and holy Moses, it's just nuts. You have pistol shots going off. It's like nothing else you've ever heard, I guarantee it. And it's only about 10 minutes long. That's why nobody plays it, because the resources that you need to get, get together to do this piece that's only 10 minutes long are absolutely insane. So you won't hear it very often. And recordings are the best way to sample it. And that one with Leif Segerstam conducting the Helsinki Philharmonic on Undine is the way to go. Um, and it's available. I mean, I know it's available. So there you go. 10 absolutely insane primitivist masterpieces that will really get your pulse pounding and your neighbors calling the police and your significant others fetching and yelling at you and your speakers exploding. And oh my God, it's so much fun. It's just raw, primal fun. And that's what it's really all about, my friends, I think anyway. So keep on listening. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.